Have you ever noticed? Mysteriously, your bank card seems to always suffer tiny deductions, trivial sums of a cent or two that most people wouldn't spare a thought for. However, when one considers the customer base of a bank numbering tens or even hundreds of millions each losing such a small amount every month, the aggregate number is rather staggering. Intriguingly, there happened to be a bank teller who conceived the plan to skim these negligible cents through which he amassed a fortune worth tens of millions. This tale is adapted from a real-life incident. The protagonist is Iman, a run-of-the-mill bank teller. On one particular day, he noticed that the bank would periodically, under the guise of various service charges, deduct insignificant amounts from the balances of its customers. Considering the total number of customers was almost 10 million, this was by no means a trivial amount. Thus, an audacious idea took root. After all, the customers wouldn't notice. Should he seize the opportunity to pocket an additional cent from each, his daily income would amount to 100,000. Upon this realization, Iman embarked on his journey of skimming off the top. Initially, he compiled a computer virus disguised as a work-related message. He attached it to an email and forwarded it to his supervisor. The unsuspecting recipient took the bait, letting down his guard. He opened the email. This allowed Iman to seize control of his computer to the extent of monitoring his every move via the supervisor's computer. Iman spread the virus to every machine within the bank after the servers at the data center crashed and subsequently attempted a reboot. A password was required. Once Iman obtained this password, he could access the bank's server, gaining control of all customer data. Next, he deducted one cent from the statements of 9.5 million customers, categorizing each deduction as a service fee, raking in $95,000 in the process. However, to extricate this sum, he certainly couldn't use his own account to receive the funds that would be fraught with risk. Hence, Iman tracked down a bank account that hadn't seen any activity for a decade and successfully redirected the funds into it. Yes! Yes! Yet the next moment at his ear, a frenzied knocking resonates. Merely two days ago, Iman was an unassuming wage earner. Although highly skilled, his lack of academic qualifications confined him to a teller's position, earning a monthly salary of 2,000. Meanwhile, within the same bank, his childhood friend Intan had already ascended to the role of cybersecurity supervisor. However, whenever a problem arose that proved too challenging, Iman was invariably called upon to resolve it. Long since weary of this existence, fate granted him no respite. Suddenly one day, his father fell ill, necessitating a substantial sum for surgery. At his wit's end, Iman was abruptly abducted by the local mafia. It turned out that his father had previously borrowed an usurious loan, leaving Iman with a mere two-day deadline. Under this dual pressure, Iman acted out of desperation. Conceiving the one-cent plan, no sooner had he successfully executed the plan than the loan sharks came calling again. Iman now possessed the requisite funds, but had yet to withdraw them. He had no choice but to evade chasing by leaping from a building after diving into a taxi. A high-speed chase started. In this dire situation, Iman was forced to ponder what would be the safest method to withdraw the money. Firstly, it was imperative not to use online transfer. The risk associated with leaving a trace was too great. Secondly, ATM withdrawals were subject to a limit. Thus, the only solution was to withdraw the money in person at the bank counter, leveraging his knowledge of banking operations. Iman fabricated a company email, notifying the bank in advance of the withdrawal. At this point, the pursuers had drawn their guns, but the taxi driver was no ordinary individual. Instead of cowering at the sight of incoming bullets, he accelerated. After a series of extreme maneuvers, they arrived at the bank ahead of their pursuers. Iman hastily presented the previously forged identification, successfully withdrawing the funds. Not only did he settle the usurious loan, the remaining money was sufficient to arrange for his father's surgery. Iman thought the matter resolved. Yet upon returning to work on the following day, he was greeted with the news that his boss was shot on the previous evening. The security promptly sealed off the bank, awaiting the arrival of the police. Iman at the front desk was in a state of panic because the email he had sent the day before was still in his supervisor's computer. If it was found, the matter of the implanted virus would be exposed. Therefore, he had to delete the virus from the server before the police arrived. The problem was he lacked the necessary permission to access the server room. A wave of anxiety compelled Iman to rush to the restroom to retch. Just then, an employee from the IT department suffering from diarrhea hastily left his phone on the wash basin. 
In an instant, Iman conceived an idea. He peeled off the tempered glass screen protector from the employee's phone, revealing a distinct fingerprint. This was the key to the server room donning the attire of a janitor. He evaded prying eyes. First, he arrived at the network center. Iman enforced a system component upgrade, temporarily disabling all bank surveillance, buying himself 15 minutes after conducting a search, he selected an unfortunate individual among those with server room access and duplicated his key card. Finally, leveraging this, he reached the server room, beginning to operate on the server. By this time, security had become aware of the irregularity and swiftly arrived at the scene, Iman managed to buy some time with a ruse. The virus was successfully deleted, and he made his escape from the server room at the last possible moment, returning to his post at the front desk. Today's ordeal was fraught with danger, but ended without incident. However, when Iman visited his father that evening, he learned from the nurse that subsequent hospitalization expenses would also incur a significant cost, but the money Iman had embezzled was nearly depleted. Had he known, he would have taken more. Now, with the entire bank on high alert, there was absolutely no possibility of striking again. This plunged him back into a quandary as Iman raised his head, looking at the logos of various banks. He was struck by an even bolder idea. His bank was not the only one in existence. And so, throwing caution to the wind, Iman repeated his act, implanting viruses into the eight major domestic banks, a total of 80 million customers. By skimming one cent from each, he could instantly acquire 800,000. With these funds, he not only cured his father, the two also moved out of their rental house and began living the affluent lifestyle. Iman's sudden wealth drew the attention of the loan sharks. They barged into his house, guns at the ready, threatening Iman with his father's life to reveal his money-making secret. Seeing his father suffer a heart attack from the stress, Iman had no choice but to confess everything. He grabbed his laptop, let the loan sharks name any bank, and in no time at all, he hacked into the server of that bank. The bank had a total of 7 million customers. With his adept manipulation, he skimmed one cent from each account and pooled the money into a dormant account. The loan sharks were initially doubting, but as soon as they recited their account number, they received a deposit notification. Then they understood Iman was a goose laying golden eggs, so they decided to squeeze out his every value and simply moved into his house. But Iman didn't just sit back and accept his fate. When the loan sharks let their guard down, he stole a gun, only to get beaten up because he didn't know how to remove the cable lock. In the end, it was his father who had to step in. Father and Iman fled to the parking lot, using up all their bullets. They zoomed away in their newly bought sports car. They thought they could easily shake off the loan sharks, but the car ran out of gasoline midway. The father and son had no choice but to abandon the car and flee on foot. Unfortunately, his father had a heart condition and was captured after only a few steps, leaving Iman escape successfully alone. Homeless, Iman had no choice but to ask his childhood friend Intan to take him in temporarily, but Iman refused to talk about what had happened to him. What he didn't know was Intan had long suspected that the incident at the bank had something to do with him. Upon receiving an extortion video from the loan sharks, Iman knew he had to find an ally. The first person coming to his mind was the driver from last time, a man of character indeed after pocketing Iman's cash, escorted Iman to the local underworld queen, a lady of influence both in light and shade revered as mother by the locals, and the lone sharks faction happened to have a recent conflict with her. Iman promptly offered that he'd pay any sum. If only she could aid in rescuing his father, anticipating mother's assistance, only to receive her outright refusal. In the absence of alternatives, the driver was left with the perilous gamble. Utilizing on his underground connections, swiftly located the building where Iman's father was held captive. Luckily, it was a hive of scum and villainy. Iman swiftly liberated his father. Yet they'd barely taken a few steps when the loan shark's minions appeared in front of their eyes. Only then did he realize it was an elaborate trap. They were waiting for Iman to fall right into, as the loan sharks were ready to tame Iman thoroughly. Suddenly, gunfire echoed from the adjacent room. Another group emerged. Instantly, a fierce gunfight ensued on the scene. Iman attempted to seize the chaos to flee, but was cornered in a room by the loan sharks. Though their dominance had faded, they sought to use Iman as their human shield. Unexpectedly, someone shot them dead. The shooter turned out to be Mother herself. After escorting his father to safety, Iman was ready to forge an alliance with Mother. 
Yet what puzzled him the most was, why did mother initially refuse only to swoop in for his rescue later? To this mother had only a single answer. There exist only two things in the world, loyalty and courage. Without these two virtues, I shall have no use of you. Does this indicate that Iman has now passed the test? Mother offered no reply. No sooner had he stepped away than two policemen appeared out of nowhere to seize Iman. The police compelled Iman to cooperate to confess the true mastermind behind last night's gunfight. Regardless of the severity of the torture or even the threat of demise, Iman disclosed not an ounce of information. It was then that Mother emerged from behind turned out. The two policemen were Mother's men too. This implied Iman had at last passed the ordeal, officially becoming one of Mother's subordinates. Yet he was in no rush to proceed, given the persistent investigation by the bank. The suspicion around Iman was mounting. He knew he needed a scapegoat to keep operating undisturbed. In the end, Iman singled out a colleague from the IT department, taking advantage of his day off to hack into his computer, leaving traces of the malware, then placing the counterfeit ID on his office desk. Sure enough, security took the colleague away shortly. The bank was convinced the mystery had been solved. Intan expressed regret for suspecting Iman before having cleared his name of all liabilities. Iman officially resigned that day, embarking on his full-time path as a hacker. With 80 million customers spread across eight national banks, every account here siphoned off a cent each day. In the span of two weeks, Iman surreptitiously stole 10 million from them. Half the spoils went to the mother, the rest was his. Iman stashed his share of the money into a newly established company account. Even if audited by tax authorities, he already had forged receipts and transactions prepared. To avoid arousing suspicion, he took out a small amount daily, hiding it at home for a rainy day. Unexpectedly, mother's appetite grew larger and larger in need of cash flow to keep the business running. She ordered Iman to prepare 10 million in cash within a week. With the current pace, it was impossible to collect such an amount. Yet, executing multiple transactions a day would inevitably heighten the risk of exposure. Iman had no choice but to take the gamble and increase the amount each time. From then on, it was up to fate. Once money was no longer a concern, Iman's attitude began to change. He hired the driver as his assistant, both of them immersed in a life of extravagance and hedonism. Meanwhile, the bank where Iman used to work after thorough investigation finally found a clue. A dormant company account of 10 years suddenly had recent transactions. Only when Intan accessed the back-end customer data did she make the startling discovery. Two months ago, they had all been charged a one-cent fee. Not long after uncovering this secret, Intan's assistant was shot by a mysterious figure in the underground parking lot. All the investigation materials at his home were missing. Subsequently, Intan learned from the bank's chief technology officer that all of the employment information of this assistant named Ash Lee was entirely fabricated. There was no record of this person in the national database. Iman heard of this news on television that night, recognizing from the killer's clothing that it was one of mother's men. Only then did Iman realize if things were to continue this way, Intan would sooner or later be killed by them. Even his father's safety could not be assured. Iman declared his intention to withdraw on the spot. But how could mother let her cash cow go so easily? To get out, he had to get rid of mother first. So Iman, taking all the money, sought out the remnants of the Lone Sharks gang. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. They had also been seeking opportunities for revenge, seeing the money. Both parties reached an agreement. As for the plan to assassinate mother, Iman had already come up with a method. Usually after each bank theft, he would forge an identity information to withdraw the money from the corresponding bank. This time he implanted the virus in the identity document and sent it to mother's bodyguard. The moment the file was opened, Iman took control of his phone, thus obtaining mother's schedule. The driver's role was to arrange manpower and set the place in time for the action. On that day, indeed, they cornered mother in a restaurant at the moment when her security was most vulnerable. Yet, oddly faced with several gunpoint, mother did not show any signs of panic. Iman decisively pulled the trigger. Unexpectedly, there was no bullets in the gun post. A few echoes of gunshots, all of Iman's crew met their fate. Turns out the driver was actually an ally of mother. His true identity was the adopted son of hers. Strategically positioned alongside Iman for long, Iman found himself with no other option but to surrender, tied, and taken back. 
Furthermore, he noticed from the news the incident of his initial bank heist had been exposed. Iman was now a wanted criminal hunted by all media nicknamed him Penny Thief. Only at this moment did he realize even the bank's CTO was subtly assisting Mother in laundering money. At this juncture, Mother commanded to bring the computer, wanted him to personally demonstrate how to rob the bank. Iman was fully aware that if he complied, his value would diminish. Most certainly, his mouth would be shut permanently. Just then, the driver brought in a bag of rats, placed them into a bag, then hooded Iman's head. Terrified and hungry rats scurrying about inside, under such brutal torture, Iman's mental defenses crumbled. He was left at their mercy. The entire process of the money heist was recorded by Mother. Once everything was completed, the driver took Iman under the bridge, prepared to execute him right there. When on the brink of life and death, Iman suddenly noticed a penny placed on a brick. It seemed like a divine signal. Seizing the moment when the driver was distracted, he threw the brick, instantly turned and fled. In the ensuing chase, the dazed and confused driver was unfortunately hit by a car. Only then did Iman successfully make his escape, but he did not simply disappear as he had to first remove the bank virus to prevent Mother from continuing stealing money by the same methods, then prepared to turn himself into the police. Thus armed, Iman returned to the bank, finally made it to the server room after taking a hostage. Yet at this moment, Intan suddenly appeared despite Iman clearly being there to assist. Regardless of how he explained, the other party refused to believe him. By then, a substantial force of police had encircled the bank building to coax Iman into surrendering. Police allowed Iman's father to personally appeal the father's voice through the megaphone. Spoke of the initial intention behind the son's transgression. It was merely to save the life of his father. No matter what others said, he still believed his son was always a good person. Hearing this, Intan finally lowered her weapon, allowed Iman to quickly delete the virus. But the entire process required time. Just a moment before completion, security still managed to track them down. Iman knew he was also one of Mother's men. The three tangled together, bought some final moments in the chaos. However, the opponent managed to reclaim the gun, aimed the gun at Intan. In this moment of danger, Iman took the bullet for her. Police finally arrived at this time. Afterwards, Iman was transported onto an ambulance. The whole drama seemed to be reaching its conclusion, but suddenly a twist occurred. News reported that the ambulance carrying Iman had inexplicably disappeared, not a trace of him to be found. On the other hand, Iman woke up from a bed located in a strange place. Everyone here was adeptly operating computers. This was an international hacker organization called Digital Reincarnation. From everyone's gaze, it was obvious that they were welcoming the arrival of Iman. Yet who appeared in front of him was surprisingly Ash Lee, who had previously been shot dead, also known as Intan's assistant. Their revenge plan had only just begun. The above was the first season of One Cent Thief. This is Pattaya. If you're interested in the continuation of the story, please show your support by thumbs up. If you like my content, please remember to subscribe to the channel too. See you next time.